MK Edelstein, thank you for being here today. I want to take this opportunity to take you back to July 1987. You immigrated to Israel. It's a difficult, after a long struggle, arrived in Alon Shavut. What is it like to come to Israel and, and immediately encounter the first intifada? Many things have happened in our lives and in the world state of Israel over the last 30 years since the Oslo Accords were signed. And on the way here, I was looking at my phone, looking for something on my schedule, and the road, the route to Alon Shvut be, happened to begin on September 4th, 39 years ago, when I was arrested in the Soviet Union. I was sent to prison and then to, to forced labor camps. When I arrived in Alon Shavut, and I must say that I saw, it was before the Oslo Accords, but I could see reality changing before my eyes. And just an, a very realistic example that I'm sure many of you can identify with. I admit that not only as a result of the imprisonment and not having enough food, I enjoy eating bananas. And the wonderful shops next to Rachel's tomb that sold fruits and vegetables, wonderful produce from the land of Israel. And that is a place where, you know, we would stop there along the way and buy things at the shops there. And in September, October in 80, 87, I was driving there, driving with, my, in my fr with a friend in his car. And remember that I certainly wasn't armed. I was a new immigrant. He, my friend wasn't armed either. And then we passed by the shops near Ra Rachel's tomb without stopping. And then we were near Dehesha, the refugee camp. I said, oh, we didn't buy bananas. And I'm out of bananas. So we stopped. It was around 1230 at night. We went into the refugee camp. There was a store that was open. We went in. We, he said, thank you. We said, thank you. We got back in our car and left. And that changed overnight in December 1987. And that reality was never restored. And my memory of Oslo is when, of what I was invited to speak on a channel. I wasn't a politician at the time. I was known only among immigrants from the Soviet Union, and I was asked to come to a, so a Russian news channel for an interview in 93, and on the way back, I drove through Bethlehem, and I saw the the masses and all of the people, you know, whatever you want to call them, I saw them being, um, hit, attacking cars, I saw riots and marches, and not not from the perspective of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Uh, as of '93, I was sick. I had been a resident of Gush Etzion for six years, and it never occurred to me during that time to buy a, to buy a gun. I carried weapons when I guarded when I had guard duty in Alon Shvut. But after that date, on September '93, the first thing I did was go to the minister Ministry of Interior and apply for a gun license. So I guess I kind of predicted what would happen after September. 1993, when people had illusions about what the Oslo Accor Accords would produce. We talk a lot about democracy and democracy in the Jewish state, the Jew state of the Jewish home, from the parliamentary perspective. When you look back at the Oslo Accor Accords, going not only from very minimal support to a very dramatic agreement. What is your perception of the critical decisions that were about the, the national Jewish state that were, how much support do you think ha there has to be in order to make these fundamental decisions? I want to say something that might be less popular especially for amongst this audience, and I'm sure that 
in that despite the fact that they agree with that, I'm sure that we agree on many things. Knesset members are Knesset members, and ministers are ministers. Everyone has the right to vote. I don't want to make a distinction between Jews and Arabs. However, what concerned me at the time, and I said, again, I became an MK in 96. During Oslo, I was a demonstrate. I demonstrated on a regular basis. I don't think I missed many demonstrations. I spent a night in a sleeping bag in Jerusalem during that weekend when there were rumors about Arafat being brought to Jerusalem by helicopter over the weekend. But as a Knesset member, I was much more. I was more concerned about how such a significant vote, how such a significant vote can be bought. And I know that a lot has happened since then, and now it's considered almost normal. At the time, it seemed like it seemed that something was not done. And unfortunately, in the votes for the Oslo Accords, it was something that did turn the tables. And it's very unfortunate the majority in the Knesset decides, but in my opinion, not in that manner, especially not when the issues are so fundamental. I also want to, now I want to take you to the time when you were a member of the 16th Knesset. <coughs> in the 16th session of the Knesset, you joined the Likud party under Ariel Sharon, and at the time, Missiles were already being shot from the Gaza Strip. It was, we had experienced the second intifada with so many victims. Operation Protective Edge and the beginning, and the, and the operation in Judea and Samaria. And then a decision is made, the decision is made regarding the disengagement, which was so unconnected to reality. How did we reach a decision of this kind in that kind of reality? There have been a lot of analyses done on that question regarding the, there are different theories about trying to avoid um, court cases and criminal in, in, in crimin, incrimination. I was taught by someone very, by a very dear person that many of you knew, Uriel, his name is Uriel Itzor, of blessed memory, and we, he taught me that we can be people of the land of Israel from the deep ideological perspective, from the deep religious perspective, believing in our biblical rights to the land of Israel. But when it comes to politics, it has, we have to learn how to use political and security tools to analyze the situation and not just yell that it belongs to us. The fact that it belongs to us is the basis for for your arguments and for the right, but beyond that, you have to analyze reality from the political and security perspectives. When we look at Oslo and the disengagement, it couldn't have succeeded. Since then, there were constantly the well-known theories. If it hadn't been for that horrific murderer who assassinated the prime minister, then Oslo would have been completely different. If it, if uh, Sharon hadn't gotten hadn't fallen sick after the disengagement, then we would have been a complete in a completely different place. And that is just avoiding a deep, cold analysis. It could not have succeeded because it was done wrong from the very beginning. It was a very quick dash in the wrong direction. And I don't know how to cope with the question about what ca what caused someone like Sharon to go ahead with a disengagement. But I do know that when I first spoke to him, when it began, eventually that stopped. We, I tried to understand the logic. And I must say that I don't know. I can't explain. But in one of the la our last conversations, I tried to save something. I said, Ari, tell, explain something to me. I don't understand your logic 100%, but I can understand, and I'm trying to understand what you think about Kvartarom, or Nitzarim, or, Gush Katif, or the Katif, Gush Katif region, but what about the three towns, the three villages in, in northern Samaria? What, did they, what is the problem with that? Why do you have to withdraw from those areas? And he gave me a short talk about, as what lecture about how do we reach the, uh, the recognized international border so that the world sees that we disengaged and we're no longer responsible for the Gaza Strip 
is it is that the case does the world not hold us responsible for everything that happens there i can't read his mind but the idea that we can disengage or withdraw and then there'll be less need for reserve duty there will, won't be a need for such large security budget security and defense budgets will reduce terrorism because the gaza strip will suddenly become singapore as shimon paris once said that theory wasn't right from the onset and collapsed over time. And I'm just a, one final question, one final statement. I'm sorry if I'm taking more time than I'm entitled to. It just hurts me. I, the, the disengagement is painful to me until this very day. So whenever we talk about it, I get I have a lot to say. There was an issue in the British Parliament. I spoke before the British Parliament, not the plenary, because there are only maybe people like the U.S. president speak. But it was a large confer conference of of, pol of Parliament members, and one stood up and said and said, don't you realize that settlements are an obstacle to peace? And I said, I respect your approach. I have a different approach. But this is an ideological case in which you say, I say one thing, you say another thing, and we can continue arguing forever. But it has been tested by re in reality. There was a plan, a disengagement plan from the Gaza Strip. There wasn't. There is not a single Jewish settlement or Jewish community, as I prefer to call it, in the entire Gaza Strip. There's not a single Jew, not a single soldier. It has been the theory has been tested, but it didn't change anything. So you may be right, but there may be other reasons, but there are obviously other reasons for the lack of peace other than your theory. And I must say in his, in his credit that at the end of the lecture, he came to me and said that I never thought of it from the perspective that I presented and there was room for thought. And it, as in, in the Foreign Affairs and, and Defense Committee, I constantly hear about how many battalions we have in Judea and Samaria, and if we didn't have the settlements and the soldiers would be training for the right wars, we have to remember that we proved without any reasonable doubt that withdrawing or escaping to an international border, quote unquote, does not save any type of budgets or save face with the international community. We are publishing a study that we did that shows ab about the number of, of victims of terror attacks since, Os since Oslo, which is nine and a half times more annually than from the establishment of the State of Israel until Oslo. And that is an, uh, that is an incredible uh, statistic. And I want to connect that to the importance of compensating the victims of terror. We know this is very a very sensitive issue, and we don't even meet the American standards. It's easier to receive compensation in the U.S. than in a terror-stricken country like our own. So how can I want to talk to you about how we can advance the law for compensation for terror victims. Uh, the statistic that you presented is absolutely correct, and I'll say something that may be surprising, but there is a lot of logic in the in the statement that you made. I when we once talked about that in the Knesset, and a senior officer talked about security before and after, and I said, "You don't need theory. I remember my reserve duty." I didn't do anything very extreme, but I did my reserve duty not far from my house, not far from where I live. I did my reserve duty, and I remember escorting buses, school buses with students, with children, or running patrols with cars. None of the cars were, were, were protected, were, were bulletproof. And in order not to, in order not to delay the bus, we would take, uh, we would ride in uh, one of those small Citroen cars. And I said, I told this officer, I said, if you put soldiers in those areas to escort buses, and would you give them a car like that? They'll give, you'll give them a vehicle that's protected, that's, that's protected, that's reinforced. 
Obviously not. So at the time, if there was a, bi a, whole, a whole a big deal about every every shot that was fired in the area, even if there were no casualties, just hearing the sounds of gunshots, it's something that would get, have everyone on their feet. But now it's something that no one even mentions. Sometimes not. Sometimes not even is overlooked if no one is killed. But when it comes to the law, I want to thank you for your question, because I hope that we that when once we are successful in completing the legislation process, it will be an enormous achievement. And sometimes, how do you know that something is good? That when people say, when some when people say to you, why didn't I think of that or, uh, beforehand? And an American Jew. Senator Garber, um, some of you may know him, very enthusiastic, and he starts, in, uh, he starts convincing MKs that they have to pass a law based on the American model, as you described. Terror, families of terror victims go through hell trying to get the compensation to, that they are entitled to from the PA. It involves lawyers and bureaucracy, and it doesn't always come to a satisfactory end. I don't want to do compare, make, com com make comparisons, but it, <clears throat> but like other victims of violent incidents, they have to come, they have to testify. It's a very long and painful process. So our friend Yitzhak Pindras is leading the initiative, and I thank him for his efforts. His bill suggests not needing to provide proof, and if the PA pays the families of the terrorist or to perpetrators of the terror attack, if they are not in Israeli prisons, then there will be a, def a clear, a clear eligibility to the family of the Israeli victims for a compensation from the Israeli government. We're, it is, it, we're still fine-tuning the law. There, it's still in the pro in process of being developed. There are cases. Uh, uh, making distinctions between uh, between different types of victims, but the main point is that we want to reach a to formulate a wording that will not require families in their condition, families of victims, to have to engage in long legal discussions and pay lawyers and appear before courts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to argue their case. So in very that is very sim it should be very very simple and straightforward. From the be at the beginning, everyone was in favor until suddenly someone, I don't want to say any names, but suddenly someone said that it's against the, p the policy of the, cab of the cabinet and it will cause the, pa the PA to collapse. So instead of just waving off that argument, I want to say that this is money that has been frozen by the PA and it is available to Israel. And why is it frozen? Because the PA, contrary to the Israeli Israeli law that was passed by a vast majority that said that the money is frozen, the PA money is frozen because they pay salaries, pensions, and stipends to terrorists. So, but despite the unfortunate fact that, despite the fact that the all of the security the security forces believe that the PA does not want or is not able to stop making these payments to the families of terrorists this fam this money will remain frozen so this is absolutely nothing to this has absolutely nothing to do with the financial situation of the PA the PA will not collapse because of this because of these payments because the money won't be going to the PA at any any time soon so it might as well go to the families of victims or serve other valuable purpose so despite the but despite the arguments it the law passed in the first reading it was it was a vast majority and we will continue the process we will complete it and I want to thank you for your question because I think that it's no less important than the important th the theories about how we cope with terror I want to say that unfortunately we have not been able to completely succeed we have all but but we have been partially successful they've done wonderful things in many cases but not a hundred percent so we do have to take care of the people who were suffered who were victims of terror attacks
for the for, for the protocol, I would say that the petty cash is was said cynically. Obviously, it is a lot of it is a lot of money that we're talking about, and that is the way it should be because a family that loses a fa loses a, a family member to a terrorist attack it deserves large sums of money not 50,000 shekels we're talking about millions of shekels and they deserve that money i don't want to give a specific number because we haven't we haven't formulated the actual sums yet but we're talking about millions of shekels we understand that from the beginning that allowing a, t a murderous terror organization to lead the Palestinians and hope maybe sign an agreement, a peace agreement with that, with that organization would not be successful, but we don't see the government offering an alternative, especially considering the fact that Abu Mazen is on his way out of the picture. There are a lot of dramatic incident things that could happen after Abu Mazen, after Abu Mazen is no longer head of the PA. I can't speak on behalf of the government. I'm not a government member, but our role is to monitor, is to supervise and find an and make sure there's an answer to your question. I completely agree, and it's not surprising because you're very familiar with this field. For many years, as the chair of the as the Knesset speaker, I attended many committees committee meetings and this question came up all the time what will happen after abbas after abu mazen is no longer in the picture and then there are all different mo's and different scenarios and what will happen in all different cases but there really isn't a single answer and there can't be a single answer because we have to understand that the nature of a regime like the PA is not something that can produce a clear successor. Sometimes the leadership goes from father to son, but in, in a regime of this kind, there is never a clear successor to the current leader. So there are a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different theories. One thing that we discussed was as follows, I'm not someone who takes things lightly. I like to think a few steps ahead and understand the alternatives. It's very easy to say that we could destroy the PA, it could, it'll collapse. I want to say what happens if we cause, if we dismantle the PA, who will take responsibility? When it comes to security issues, obviously they cannot, cannot and do not want to handle those aspects. But when it comes to everything else, civilian issues, they still have at least a partial ability to m monitor and handle those infrastructures. And I want to know who will be taking over. But what concerns me, there are some people that say we have to support the PA, some not to support the PA. But what concerns me in this context is that not is everything, and not everything is under our control. And I said so in the committee, and I'll say so today. We do not want to reach a situation in which the patient is long dead and the patient's monitor is completely flat and we're still giving a medica medication and IV, etc. That's something that that's a situation that we cannot reach. So I demanded and we will and there will be a, another meeting on this topic there. We need a plan. I don't want to hear the opinions. I want in like in war games, something happens, Abu, assuming that Abu Mazen passes away or, does, or is no longer in the picture. The PA collapses. What is the alternative? Not saying that we will continue to support the PA or continue to try to form to keep it unified. There, we need a plan. We need an alternative. There are a lot of ideas. There are different programs working with the the Emirates or other countries. I don't love any of the scenarios, but in a serious country, we cannot have a situation in which we're not prepared for a reality that may happen any at any time, even in two weeks from now. So we will continue to monitor the situation. The cabinet, the they will want them to dis address what will happen in a scenario of this kind. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to say that we finished a study. I thought it was done. A very comprehensive study on the different scenarios and strategic solutions for each for each scenario. And I'd be happy to discuss this with you in the future. And one last question. We are seeing a vast change 
in you in Hamas dominance not only in Gaza at the time uh, there was great support in the differentiation but now it's not only in Gaza it's in the north it's in Syria it's in Judea and Samaria it's in the Golan Heights and collaborating with others so from your angle as the chairman of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee how do you see this vast change that we have been witnessing these last few years and of course the Iranian involvement in the Palestinian system I would suggest dividing it up to start from the end. Iranian involvement is felt in everything, in everything that happens in Gaza, in the West Bank. Now, do not get confused. It doesn't mean that from a tactical perspective, on a tactical level, some Iranian is telling a person tomorrow you will be at the square and commit suicide with a bomb or shooting or anything like that but at a level where there's indoctrination where there's financial support where there is supply of weapons on all of these levels this is an endless flow the defense establishment is of course trying to stop it we of course have borders that are more um, protected or less protected. We're not going to tell our enemies where to smuggle from, but some know the reality very well. And that is why there is a problem with that. In addition, Hamas as a factor, look, it enjoys, it is having a good time enjoying itself. Hamas as a factor is certainly dominant. It enjoys this eternal dilemma. I hope that within these last few minutes I ha you've already learned that I do not only say demagogical slogans. It is a real genuine dilemma. Today's quiet or the arming and the effect that we see coming up. And that is all considered considerations not only in Israel. And it's clear that we are playing a very dangerous game vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah too and Hamas too where they're getting armed. And if we do not put a stop to it, if we do not limit it, if we, do not, if we cannot use the war between wars in order to address this, then we will find ourselves in a very severe conflict, much more severe, or the price will be much higher than perhaps smaller contained steps that can be taken today. And Hamas is feeling resilient, and therefore we go into Judea and Samaria more, and there are more attempts to try and influence uh, Israeli Arabs, including in the Negev, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the committee, what we can and should do is to really see in the material that no red lines are being crossed that are perhaps invisible, or maybe not invisible, but if you look closely if you really know the material backwards and forwards and you know when to say stop we can no longer see them building their power and getting armed and we must respond even if it is not popular even if it sounds like we started it but unfortunately otherwise the results and outcomes can be very very harsh in the conflict that will develop your committee engages in security but it's foreign affairs and security so it also engages in foreign affairs and we hear a lot about the matter of Saudi Arabia and the attempt to bring about normalization and to pr promote this process we're not supposed to discuss this we're talking about 30 years to Oslo but the reason I'm asking this question in the Palestinian context is that we see that the Americans are quite determined to bring the Palestinian issue into this equation and I want to know what your personal view is on what the red lines Israel should have and the tension between the very big importance of normalization of Saudi Arabia not only because Saudi Arabia is what it is but because it is the leader of the Sunni world and that will probably bring uh, with it many other agreements vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we are willing or not willing to do in Judea and Samaria. First of all, 
you f phrased this very well in terms of who is trying to bring the Palestinian issue into this. The Saudis, less so, I don't want to say something irresponsibly, but I want to tell you without a smile. And I admit that just a while ago I said that we need to be able to analyze things with insight and politically and coldly, but what can we do? All of us are also human beings, and I hope that we all have a worldview and ideology, and what can we do? I believe in the greater Israel vision. I would not rush to concede, especially since it hasn't proven itself on not, not a practical level or an ideological one. But having said all of that, if I were told that these are these items in the agreement Saudi Arabia, what are you concerned about? I am not sure that, how shall I say it, that according to the items that appear in foreign press reports, I'm not sure that the only problem I would have, or the biggest problem I would have is with, batch, is with the Judea and Samaria. Because of course, if it comes to withdrawal or an, any other option like that, then the answer is no. But there are far more sensitive and problematic items in this potential agreement. And here too, we will once again be, uh, have to face a dilemma. Of course, this agreement would be very important. No one doubts that. But when it comes to cost effectiveness, we must think about how we try not to risk ourselves uh, in ri and find ourselves in a Middle Eastern race, that is an over-motivation to reach an agreement faster uh, and have the schedules dictated by a political reality in other countries instead of in this country. And so let me once again reiterate that it is very important to make sure that nothing be said um, that cannot be taken back about Dan and Samaria, but what's also important, maybe more important, is to follow items uh, in this agreement that have to do with the future of the State of Israel and the security of the entire region. M. K. Uli Edelstein, Head of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee, thank you very much.